morning, one and all. Thank you for joining us here in the Zoom Cafe for the Coffee at 11 show, brought to you by wigram.ie SME Ear Support. I'm very excited today for several reasons. Number one, this is our 50th Coffee at 11 show. I cannot believe it. This is our 50th Coffee at 11 show. And a you know, round of applause for all involved. And uh, we made a commitment. I made a commitment several weeks ago. It turns out it's 10 weeks ago now that... Uh, I would go live with what has become the Coffee at 11 show every weekday, Monday to Friday, uh, for as long as COVID lasted, expecting it would last about three weeks, right? Here we are, 50 shows in, and we're going to go on to the 7th of August because the, uh, the lockdown officially lifts on the 10th of August. So we have another 50 shows to go. Happy days. But in particular, I'm excited today because uh, the lady who's my special guest today is somebody I've been a fan of quietly for many years. Uh, lost sight of her, I suppose, when I left Dublin. And uh, then she uh, turned back up and has been involved in the cafe, has joined the cafe over the last month or so. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce you today to Bridget McLaughlin. Bridget, you're very welcome. Please say hello and show us your coffee mug. Good morning. Good morning, Colin. It's great to have you here, Bridget, and I better explain uh, what, what I suggested there. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, you might just say another quick hello, Bridget. Uh, I think we agreed pre-show that you get the uh, the prize for the very best backdrop for the Coffee at 11 show. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. <laughs> and am I right in saying that this is Biddy's cottage and it's 26 years of love in the making? That's right. This is my home and the cottage and... It all looks very perfect and everything is, but there's a lot of love and care going into it. I'm here 26 years in Dorking, so it's, about, it's a little bit of Donegal in Dorking. Like, so it's, um, uh, this is a great uh, it's travel footfall here, but I mean, you could literally just come in here and be quiet, despite all the chaos of Dorky around me, you know? Beautiful. So, we're going to come back to that in just a second. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you a little bit about this, uh, this lady before we bring the lady herself in. So Bridget Biddy McLaughlin, Biddy's Cottage is uh, her business, although it's more a lifestyle than a business, I think. Uh, her business is storytelling with a focus on rural Ireland, the characters, the heritage, and Irish traditional cooking. And she's got a surprise for us in a little while. Uh, established in 2015, how many employees? Two, herself and her son, Johnny. And uh, Bridget goes on to say that she's a former journalist with the Sunday Indo. And that's when I remember Bridget way, way back when I was uh, managing Beauties and Grafton Street in the early 90s. And Bridget was legendary around the town. Uh, so she was a former journalist with the Sunday, or as I call it, a, refor a reformed journalist with the Sunday Independent and the Sunday Times in London and Punch magazine also in London. She's a storyteller folk artist and cookery writer. She believes everything in her life from journalism, painting and folklore is synonymous with stories. She's the author of two books, Marcella Erser a children's book translated into Irish and published by Ungum and Behind the Half Door, Stories of Food and Folk, written with her colleague Katie O'Connell. Her passions are baking, preserving Irish heritage, Irish folklore, old Irish recipes and vernacular Irish furniture. Never heard vernacular used in those terms. I'm curious about that. And she swims daily in the Irish Sea, which apparently is just across the road from the cottage. And there's uh, something nobody knows about Bridget. She said, I make trout snares from horsehair. There's a first and probably a last on the Capital Level Show. Bridget, for all those reasons, I'm delighted that you've joined us here as uh, our special guest today. So in your own words, please take us through those early years, pre Biddy's Cottage, please. Well, um, childhood sets the stage for all of us, as we all know. And um, I was born in North County, Dublin, which is kind of um, a quarantined area, a very strange area called The Ward. Even the name is strange, The Ward. And it's on the border of Mead and Dublin. And my father's from Donegal and my mum was from Waterford, Dublin, she likes to say, and between the two. And they're amazing people. So um, I'm the eldest of eight children, seven girls and one boy. And um, my, father, my father sold farm machinery, was his, his you know, that was his occupation but he's a brilliant man, a strict disciplinarian as children, I have to say, we all agree with that, but an extraordinary man in terms of wisdom and in terms of humble kind of um, education in all things about storytelling, rural. Um, he's extraordinary. My mum is equally extraordinary. So, and all my, my sisters are all very gregarious, very arty, very creative. So the creative gene is in all the family and my brother as well. Um, so I grew up um, listening to the stories of the farmers, um, I was surrounded by platinum prairies of wheat fields like Kansas. Um, I, because of the Ls, I was quite a, a, a nervous, shy child. 
as I always say, I became an extrovert. I was an introvert who became an extrovert to survive this world. And um, I found the ward was very interesting because we had Flemish farmers that came from Belgium. We had the Protestant uh, ascendancy. We had a lot of land commission farms from Mayo and Clare. And, we, and then we had the kind of ward union hunt. So it was a very odd cacophony of different kind of lifestyles and people. Of course, horticulture, farming. So all the farmers would come to dad. And my favorite place to hide, to get peace from the family, instead of like, you know, we had to wash cloth nappies in those days. And um, we all worked, we picked potatoes, we picked strawberries, we picked raspberries, we picked tomatoes, we picked daffodils. We all worked, all our family worked. And um, so my, my one escape was, I don't know who's familiar here, which is a far combine harvester. But combine harvesters have a ladder on the side and they have a little section where the grain comes in and there's a window behind the driver's seat. So I would get into the brand new uh, combine harvester and get in there, draw over all the manuals to my father's chagrin and horror, right? And because combine farmers are very expensive. And I'd sit in there and observe the world from that little portal, square portal. And um, I drew all the characters I drew now, I drew then. So I was painting the same folk characters I do now, I did then in pencil. And I was drawing and painting all my life and creating things. And everything is connected with a story. So um, when I was a child, I was obsessed with land um, in a nice way. And I would be in the Wellingtons, the Black Wellingtons those days. Some of us who were older would remember those. And um, walking through the fields, you'd find a lot of delf, which is my obsession with collecting delf, a lot of blue willow pattern and things and brown willow pattern. And I'd pick them all up and all the shards of it in the clay, go home, collect big buckets of it and wash it. And my dream disappeared because I always wondered who ate out of that cup or drank out of it, that dish, um, who used these instruments. Um, did someone throw a cup at someone in an argument? Um, you know, like, did they use it to wash their hair? Um, you know, did they, they fill it with grain? All of these things had a huge, and an instinctive feel for these things as a very young child. And then my dad got really narky when he saw the big pile of delf in the buckets and he just threw it all back into the fields and gave, there was hell had no fury. So my dreams were absolutely shattered with that day. I always remember that day, it was horrible. Um, but anyway, that's, re that's reality. I love my dad dearly, by the way, just in case you think <laughs> there's any problem, there's not, yeah. So anyway, um, so that was my interest and in listening to the stories of the farmers. They'd come up at harvest time, you know, knocking on the windows, big bottles of thick cream, buttermilk, and it was all kind of, my whole, the whole atmosphere was of wheat, grain, earthy foods. Um, my mum cooking, my mum's a fine cook, a very good cook and um, home baker. And that was, my, that was my life. So it was very, very interesting, collecting tadpoles, things that people no longer do. Like now when you ask a child, it's their, their earliest memory. Sadly, they'd say McDonald's or they'll say Leisureplex. I mean, these were memories. We're the last, I'm the last of the generation of people who knew childhood, who had the freedom. And we were so blessed and lucky because now a child, even my own son, I'm afraid to let him at the door when he was small, now he's fine. But you know, the anxiety we have today compared to those days, we had total freedom to wander in rivers, be gone for hours. So all of this was embedded in me. Wow. Well, wow, Bridget, that's, uh, that's some entrance, and thank you for coming into the cafe this morning and sharing your story with, you, with us. Uh, you know, I, I was making notes there, some of the magic words that you used. You, you, you described platinum prairies of wheat fields. Yes. Uh, for me, it was just a field, but now a platinum prairie of wheat fields. Beautiful. Uh, cacophony, you used that uh, word to describe the influx of various different people from various different sectors of society. Um, you, you, you mentioned cloth nappies. You're absolutely not old enough to remember cloth nappies, but you mentioned those and you mentioned black wellies. I remember the black wellies for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and then you picked up all these little bits of, uh, actually the, the description of you looking out the back of the combine harvester and viewing the world from that, that itself was magical. And the folk art work that you do today is reflective of what you did back then, except it was done in pencil. Um, but you also said that you were out collecting those little bits of uh, Delph, and we all know it, I'm sure we've all experienced that somewhere along the way, and the, but you collected a bucket of them, and uh, they were all shattered pieces, but then you said that you, your, your dreams were shattered when your dad threw them all out again. So, yes. a magical description of a magical childhood, and what did you say, we were the last generation to have a childhood, that's a bit scary. 
Um, it, was, it is a bit scary, but I mean, obviously there are exceptions. And I, I love the country, obviously, and children growing up in the country now, it's great to see kids in the country. I just love it. And myself and my son, Johnny, who's 12, we're constantly on the road. My favourite place to be in is in the car, on the road. And we go down to Galway a lot. And although that said, I have a huge connection with Limerick as well, through food and everything else. And there's a chapter in my cookery book on a lady in Limerick, um, from Clunara in Limerick. And um, I, I, what's it, Carrie Clancy. And she, my favourite place to go in Limerick is the Curry Gower, Fish Bar. Yeah, I just love it, the Curry Gower. It's just my favourite place. And my fav some of my favourite people in Limerick are, I've never met this hero of mine, um, Jerry Andrews, the photographer um, who did the book on Limerick Milk Market. Have you ever seen that? No? Oh my God. It has the best photographs of Limerick people from the milk market in the 70s. They're grainy black photographs. And he's the most extraordinary photographer. But he's a hero of mine. I've never met him. And another um, woman, uh, Ruth Geary, who I've also never met, wrote a book called Pigtown about the history of the bacon factories in Limerick, which absolutely fascinated me. Fascinated. Yeah, I see uh, uh, Katrina there nodding away. She knows those characters. And uh, when you when you mentioned, I presume the book was a contemporary book, but in fact, it's back in the seventies. I do know that book, indeed. I'm, I'm very familiar with those images. Milk Market, of course, is a whole different ball game these days. Um, but yes. I'm sure, Katrina could probably hook you up with uh, various different characters around Limerick. Uh, we'd be delighted to see can we do that. Um, yes. Look, fascinating stuff. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, very very background how did you get into journalism that's when i first stumbled across you and i i was enthralled by your writing i think i shared that with you before but i was genuinely enthralled by it and uh, so that then when you, you started as i say sniffing around the cafe and you, you found uh, yourself your way into our little cafe here i was delighted no, delighted now right. in particular that you yeah um i love the cafe i just one of my favorite parts of the day now is the cafe um, as a journalist, I had no experience. Um, I studied in UCD years later and failed all my exams. I studied in minute theology, failed all my exams. My dad said, um, you haven't got an academic bone in your body. So I went back to college much later, much later and did a master's. But years later, my 30s. But when I, journalism, I was, I had um, worked in um, pirate radio stations. I had a very varied background. Um, and then I was literally, a friend of mine out the who's who to Ireland and said, Bridget, you should really, he knew I liked to write. I did awful plays in Temple Bar. I mean, I was terrible, did terrible thing. I was wild, absolutely wild, untamed and wild. And um, I really went against the grain and everything, I'd say, everything. Um, so I went and he said, go to Anne Harris and Sunday Independent. So I hung out the door like a frightened rabbit. And she was always busy passing through and wait. I mean, it talked about waiting. I just waited and waited every day for her. And I didn't, I'm not a person that goes up to people, but I just waited in the hope. And I've been lucky. So eventually one day she said, she said, I'm really looking at you standing here. Come up, she said, and we'll talk, right? And, um, and then uh, a few people came in and I got intimidated and she was on the phone and I left. And then she contacted me and said, listen, why did you leave? And I just said, well, I just got a bit nervous. So she said, come back in again. So then she, she saw something in me. And um, so I worked at her pace, what she wanted first, never worked in an office, hate offices. And then um, I was suddenly then, I, I love older people because of their stories. And this is all connected storytelling. And she said, Bridget, it's only independent, aren't you really interested in older people, to be honest with you. That's the fact, right? She said, if you get in the photograph with them, because you're young and blonde, and if it's a good story, we will put you in. So I said, so, okay, I'll sacrifice that. And I'll do that to get the people in. So every photograph, unfortunately, it's, it's me. I'm in every photograph, but that's very Sunday the Indo. But the great thing was that it got the older people's stories in. And these weren't um, celebrities. These were extraordinary people with extraordinary lives, often unknown. And I befriended, of course, most of them. Another one was Michael Harton at the poet from Newcastle West, who I absolutely adored and befriended. Um, John B. Keane, he was a great friend of mine. And so all these people um, I met and then I got, you know, I got known in the independent country people loved the writing and my, you know, my, my kind of audience were rural Irish farmers and their wives. And that was my, still is my audience, believe it or not. So then what happened then was I had some very lucky breaks, very lucky breaks. I left the independent after years and, um, and I got, um, just by pure chance, I'd written an article about a guy called Stan Gebber Davis, a journalist. And David Palmer, the new, the new man in the Independent, had seen it on the plane. And I literally had passed planes with him to go to London to work for the Sunday Times. And he said, I want her back. And they came over. I, I was in the lucky position where the editor came over to me in London and asked me back. So didn't go back immediately. <laughs> 
and wait for a long time. And then I came back and then another lucky thing, I've been very lucky. Another lucky thing happened then was I interviewed this chaotic woman who was a contest in the south of France who had a gun and everything and kind of kept me hostage there for about two days. And I wrote a very funny story about her. And she wrote, uh, sent a story to Peter Mackay, who's the, now, who was just, you know, um, he was just appointed the editor of Punch magazine. And she had, she knew her really well, because she's just providing stories in the Daily Mail. And when he, she was giving out hell about me, this journalist from Ireland arrived over and she wrote for this and that. And I was, I was serving her raw liver, which she was, and, um, and treating my servants badly, which she was. And um, he roared with laughter. And his secretary rang me and said, Mr. Mackay wants you to work for Punch. And um, so pure luck, pure luck, went over. We got on like a house on fire. Some of my friends said, how could you work for Punch with its history against the Irish? And I said, hold on here, I said, right. You're talking to a very strong Irish woman here, I said. But I said, you have to infiltrate. You have to be part of something of the other side in order to, <laughs> in order to give interesting stories and let them see how, <laughs> how good the Irish are. I mean, and um, so wow. I did. So I, I had a great time there. I, I went to the punch lunches. I met Ober and Woe. I had a ball. Um, uh, I went, went, they sent me to, I asked them, like, what, they said, what are, you, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to be a boxing correspondent. Because I, now, not because of the actual boxing, the audience. So they sent me to Las Vegas, interviewed Mike Tyson, the founder of Holyfield, ringside seats, because the Americans thought that Punch was a boxing magazine. And um, so um, I had a great time, a great time. And then Punch closed down. And I did a few other literary pieces for them as well um, with a sense of humor. Um, but I loved the crap in London. I love London. Absolutely. It was very good to me, London. So it was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. What a, what a wonderful story, right? Uh, doorstep and Anne Harris, and you finally get a meeting and then you leave before she talks to you. Right. Uh, incredible. You've got great stickability. Uh, the Contessa with the gun feeding your own liver, yeah. <laughs> treating your servants bad. Yeah. And it leads you to a gig with Punch uh, magazine. Like, it's quite incredible. And you, you mentioned luck, but we spoke of this on the show regularly. Uh, we speak about it regularly, which is we create our own luck. You, you have the X Factor. Anne Harris saw something in you, and you have the X Factor for sure. And that's coming through in everything that you do. So it's just, it's a wonderful journey so far. So we're now back in Dublin. What's happening next, please? Um, well, I, unfortunately, a lot of then, despite all the luck I had, um, I've had a lot of bad luck as well. So um, I married a fantastic man and, um, and he was a wine importer, which is, was a great <laughs> for me because <laughs> I love wine. And, um, and he was a classic gentleman and very dapper and lovely and kind, and he died, unfortunately. Um, we were just, I had got, I had breast cancer, and his pre, he was a widower, his wife had died of breast cancer, and I always, t you know, it was a nightmare time, and um, it was horrendous, and got through the cancer, no problem with the cancer, actually, I was more worried about him, to be honest, and um, flew through that, and then he had a, a near drowning accident on Cliney Beach, and then, sadly, he, had a, he drowned, on, just not down far from here. And so that was horrendous. So that was my um, two years of quarantine in the cottage. Ah, Bridget, uh, terribly sorry to hear that. I yeah, oh, no, 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 but it's fine. It's, no, it's fine now, right? That's only, that was only the beginning of it, right? And then I, I always make this part short. The reason I mentioned this, because it's amazing how you can come through things and how things feed on like erosion beats, something else. And um, so then... Uh, they're not, I got, you know, two years, you never get over that, but I, I'm fine now. And, um, and then um, my sister was murdered, as a lot of people know. I don't talk about that very much, but she's pivotal. Siobhan was pivotal in what happened next because um, she knew the cottage well. She was a hotelier, chef. Um, she worked in the Shelburne. She was grafting since she was 10, worked on the building sites. So she was a huge influence on me as a sister and as a, as a, as a mentor. And she was five years younger than me. And so I went out to work with her in her hotel and through sheer half graft, she had a boutique hotel, she got the number, number one Condé Nast small hotels, just herself. She learned Mallorcan, she learned Spanish and we did the recipes together. And my, I was so lucky that I had those six months with her because the following year she, she, she was murdered. But um, what she had said to me, Biddy girl, she called me Biddy girl. She said, it's only independent. And by, by the way, Anne Harris, I adore Anne Harris. She was so good to me. She is incredible. I still keep in touch with her. But anyway, she said, you're doing a bit, some of the journalism you're doing right now is quite dark, she said. 
um, there was a story about Dawkey, which was a bit dark and I was a bit to kind of shouldn't have really probably have done it in terms of like it was too close to the bone. And then I did a lot of murder stories, ironically enough. And Siobhan said, leave it, pity, leave it. So a week before she died, um, she stayed she was in the cottage here with me, sleep on that sofa. And she said, go back to the art, go back to the art. And we were writing a cookbook together, the two of us in Spain. And she said, we've finished a cookbook, the two of us, and we'll probably open a restaurant, the two of us. And I said, great, Johnny, great. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen, right? So the, I'll just skip that part because it was just too horror, horror it's too horrific to even talk about. Um, uh, so anyway, but my life has been very much in honor. It's my own life, but I live it very much in honor of hers as well. And she's there with me for everything I cook, every tart I bake, she's beside me. Every pull of my apron, she's pulling it tighter. And every time I need some advice, she's be, I'm asking her out loud, Johnny, tell me this, is there too much uh, five spice in that? Is there too much in this? And um, so she has a, she's very much a huge part of my uh, look as well. If I may, uh, Tony Strand started the Buddha bus there in honour of your story and your sister and, uh, and your, your husband. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank I you know, for that. Uh, didn't know the, those depths, obviously was aware of elements of it. Yeah. You know, because but everybody has darkness in their life and that's very important to acknowledge it, not to, not to go on about it too much, but um, it forms you. I mean, it really, 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 uh, you have to be mentally resilient to deal with those things. You have to be. And, um, and the resilience comes from simplicity in the end. It's all from simplicity, the simple life. Like I always, I'm always saying, I uninvented myself after Siobhan died. I pared back everything, pared back everything. And, um, and that's what I've done. And I wasn't intending this to be a business. It just evolved as an organic entity of its own. It's not really a business either. It's more of a lifestyle, as you say, Colin, you know? Yeah, it's, it, 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 I think it's fairly obvious that it's a lifestyle for you, uh, Bridget. You live it. I live it. I live it, yeah. yeah. We, see, we see the fire. What's burning in the fire behind you? What do you think, Nelcon? Only turf, the best of turf. <laughs> I, was, I, I, was, I was half afraid. I presumed it was, but I was half afraid. No baguettes here. No baguettes here. No baguettes here, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, did I, did I, do I smell apple pie somewhere? Yes, I have a big apple pie here. Hold on now. Every mor well, not two mornings a week. Ashley, ladies, and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, be forewarned, look at this, look at this. My sister Ashley calls them pregnant. <laughs> and when she comes over and I'm taking them out of the oven, she's going, push, push. <laughs> Wonderful. Only, only you and Siobhan will be very proud of you. She will be. She will be, yeah. Yeah, she will be. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, come here, it is a lifestyle more than a business, but, uh, and you've got your folk art, I'm right in saying that on the wall behind you there? Yes, I have folk art. Um, it's, uh, folk art is very, not everybody understands folk, folk, art, folk art, but it's not, not much different than journalism. It's stories again, like, and how people perceive them. Um, I have one little one here, I'll just show you. Um, this is a tip, the fox is very important to me, right? And this is resting guarded by my fox. Now, some people, it's very interesting to think he's dead, but he's not dead. That's their negative thing coming true. He's actually just relaxed. And the fox is guarding him safely in the snow. And um, the fox is very significant to me because there's a lot of foxes in Dawkey. I mean, there's big fat foxes and skinny ones everywhere, um, urban foxes. And um, the fox, when you, you know, when you're talking about COVID and you're talking about uh, you know, life and reflection, when you see a fox on the road, whether you're in Limerick, Carlo, Galway, anywhere, you're forced to catch its gaze and, and you just stop. You have to have the, you know, you cultivate the stillness for that moment. And then the fox, it's kind of a sacred thing. Then it disappears over a wall or a hedge and we can't follow its journey in the same way we can't follow our own journey. So the fox is very present in a lot of my paintings. Yeah. That, uh, that, that, that's amazing. I, I, I knew there was foxes uh, prevailed in your work, but I didn't know the reason uh, why. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, and so, so folk art is, is, is that it? It's storytelling through, through art? Well, I do, believe it or not, um, uh, I have, um, it's what happens is I, when people started visiting the cottage, I didn't, uh, you know, start off with this busy co busy cottage. People would visit, and I love the idea of a rambling house, and um, I'm more protective of it now as a structure, obviously. Um, but people started visiting, and they were really interested in, in the nostalgia of the turf fire, um, you know, the sacred heart brought memories back, 
um, everything about it, they peer to, to the half tone, say, oh my God, that reminds me of this. And then again, look again, um, you never know who's in the cottage, you see. You never know who's there. They have to book it and they never know. And um, this man was there one night and he was a um, big CEO in America. I didn't know that. And his friend was the, head, was the head of Facebook, right? So they came to the cottage. I didn't know who they were. And um, they started telling their friends, you must come here. And suddenly then I had a more corporate people ringing me, like Odyssey International. Kevin Shannon was a great help to me. Um, he's um, the executive chairman of Odyssey International. And they wanted something different. Like we live in a very, the modern world is very homogenized. I mean, everything is the same, right? Everything. And um, that's the kind of sad thing about life. Um, I'll remain an optimist, but it is. And like, when you see, but people tell me about the corporate life, which I have a total, like, I mean, I know nothing about it really, except for like, I get the other side of the nice side. Um, but they have like, you know, basketballs and they're, in, you know, they have, they bring in coffee machines and they bring in restaurants and they bring in, um, you know, tennis courts and, have, and they have obstacle courses for their, for their teams. So, I mean, there are other experiences beside those. And so then what happened was there was team buildings happening in the cottage and they would arrive and they would, um, they would, you know, listen to, to some stories and not all everything i do is authentic there's no paddy wackery absolutely none i work i work research in the folklore department um i love what i do i absolutely passionate about it and there's always something when they come in that they're connected with if they're interested in cooking they're in heaven if they're interested in folklore they're in heaven if they're interested in donkey they're in heaven if they're interested in heritage they're in heaven and if they're interested in just sitting down and relaxing and having an irish cocktail they're in heaven or sometimes maybe a potching, depending on the night and the audience. And, um, but it's all very controlled, I have to tell you. <laughs> it has to be. It has to be, yeah. So I have a very strict closing time, right? And I, have, I keep it in strict order. So I'm a strict uh, taskmaster. Like, I mean, I'm all, it's all great crack, but once 11 o'clock comes, the bell goes, like you're gone, you're out, down the road. Goodbye, slon. And, um, but so the team builders arrived with the corporate clients and they are fantastic because they are experiencing something that they've never experienced before. Um, it's, a non, it's a non-work environment for them and they're, they're learning all the time and it's more intense for them in a way because they're in a cottage and it's more relaxing and they talk more. And one of Kevin Shannon's brought this group, he said to me, Jesus, Biddy, he rang me up, he won't mind me saying this. And he rang me and said, Jesus, Biddy, I said, I have this group, he said, um, they're, they're from, from American motor industry, he said. In all his years, like he's in the business a long time, 40 years, he said, no, we brought them everywhere. We brought them to Balnehinch. We brought them to the best castles in Ireland, he said. And they just can't connect them. They have nothing to say. And he said, you're the last, you're the last post now, so we're really dependent on you. And I said, Kevin, I said, leave it to me. You're, they're in good hands. When the minute they arrived in, I knew this was like pulling hen's teeth by them, right? They were as dead as doornit, all of them. They were like, literally, they, they were horizontal. My magic, may I say, in terms of my passion, is nothing, nothing. This is this is this is me. Like once they got relaxed, set them down, had their little cocktails, started to relax a bit more. The shoulders went down, and they talked and they interacted. Now, would I say on a great scale? No, but on the scale they were at before, brilliant. So Kevin was in the background going to this here to me. So, um, so it, the cottage's energy has the ability to deep thaw anybody. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's fair to say the cottage cottage has energy because of you. I think it's a symbiotic relationship. And uh, yeah, Sarah has started the Buddha bus there. Uh, that was that's a great story. Great story. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's it's a hundred percent authentic. There's no paddy whackery. Uh, no. Experiences are too homogenized these days. Patricia, um, who was in yesterday, Patricia Roberts from Number One Perry Square, said exactly the same. She set up Number One Perry Square to, to break away from this sort of homogenous experience in hotels. And she's created her own unique space, as you have done there. Uh, perhaps the difference is you didn't necessarily intend it to become, for it to become what it has become, but it's become something very special and uh, wonderful to witness. So thanks for inviting us in there today. No, By the way, the delighted. We'll, uh, there'll, be, there'll be a queue of people looking to do um, all sorts of stuff there, um, team building, etc. Oh, so, sorry, one thing, Colin, sorry. Um, when people are here, they often get hungry because I'm showing them apple tarts and things and I give them apple tart. So some of that's how the, the dinner started, right? Now, I, I am very, I don't kill myself, right? I don't kill myself working, right? I have a very good balance in my life, right? I have no ambition, right? None. 
I just let it flow, right? I'm very organized, I'm super professional, but I don't, I have no ambition to do anything. I don't want bus tours or anything like that. I don't advertise this, it's all word of mouth, by the way. All word of mouth. There is no advertising for this cottage. Um, on Facebook, maybe, that's all. And um, so I've no interest in that. So when they came, though, people said, God, you know, could you do us a dinner and everything else? And um, because um, it's not a restaurant, I gift a dinner, in other words, to corporate people um, who look after me. And um, it's a, I set the cuisine with the event. And of course, there's stories behind all the food. Um, I am a good cook, I have to say. And um, I love it. I absolutely love it. Food is a great things. And Limerick, of course, has a great history in food as well. And um, I remember going down there to the butchers down there and um, O'Connell's. And in Limerick, they have the tripe and the pack. And the things I would never go is tripe now. But um, the stories of chitterlings in Limerick, you know, people living off awful and horrible things. But, you know, poverty is, is linked to all the stories as well. And poverty is linked to the cottage as well. Because this is a very simple fisherman's cottage. That's what it was. It was built in 1870. Um, for the fishermen down the harbour here, and there's nothing, there's nothing um, uh, posh about this house. It's very pretty, but it's very stalwart and very humble and very strong, earthy house because it's got the big thick walls. But poverty fascinates me because we all have poverty in our background, in our lineage, and um, without poverty, we wouldn't have the resilience, we wouldn't have the stories, we wouldn't have the humour. Um, the one thing I always ask people when they come here is to really. Um, this is before COVID and everything else and after, obviously, but the one thing I do is ask them to really search their ancestors because we owe our ancestors everything. I mean, in this house here, I have a big, you can't see it now, but I have a big famine pot that from my great grandmother was born in 1860. And it's her pot I have. And that was inherited by her from the family. She had 22 children. So that pot is here and it's very much important to my life. And oak cake stands, I collect a lot of culinary uh, vernacular instruments and furniture. So um, I love it. And Bridget, you used that term earlier, uh, and I introduced you, uh, vernacular furniture. I've never heard the word vernacular used beside furniture before. Can you explain the, the link? Yes, vernacular is furniture is very rare, right? It's much sought after. And it really is the simplest, earliest furniture in Irish, the Irish home. So I have a dresser, which you've seen before, the yellow dresser here, full of delf. A dresser, you know, they used to be painted brown. The dresser was an essential part of the Irish home. A lot of people didn't have kitchen tables, and certainly my father's time in Donegal, his ancestors, they never had a kitchen table. They sat around on creepy stools, which would also be vernacular stools, by a fire, and they would have, um, they had the harness stand, which is down there, you can't really see it clear enough, but the harness stand, and the, um, you have all the utensils that they would have used. I mean, years ago, when you got, those times when you got married, you didn't get a diamond ring, you got a pot and an oat toaster, and like, Good luck, like, that was it, good luck. There was no food aids or anything else. Um, so those things are all really precious to me. And even the, I was saying about the horsehair snare that my father was talking about, um, these were used for catching fish. Extremely important. I mean, dad always says that Bear grills, you know, like, what's he talking about? Like, he's got a camera here and a camera there. Like, my dad would be the ultimate survivor in terms of, and he makes the horsehair snares and told me how to make them. And they, they work, I've seen them working perfect. My dad fishes with them all the time, yeah. And of course, horsehair is very strong. So I would bring them to the Folklore Commission in UCD, and we would we would you know constantly interact with information and pres you know it's all I'm very much into conservation and preservation of our rural past. It's one of my, my most important missions. Yeah, and it seems to me like uh, you're leaving legacy. You're you know you're 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 bridging a, a period of time here, and you're bringing and keeping the stories alive. The the famine pot's amazing. Yes, yes, That's huge. It's huge. Huge, absolutely huge, yeah, yeah. Um, so those things have a kind of a, re they resonate in the cottage. I only have a few objects that are really important to me, because I'm not, I'm not interested in uh, materialism really, but I mean, well, that, that's wrong, sorry. I do like some nice things, obviously. And I love good food and good wine, sorry, I'm wrong. <laughs> but in food, yes, but in actual other things, no. But I really have uh, a few objects that I really um, love dearly. Um, and I just love may, them. May I, may I say, you're a fabulous enigma. Right, and that's the best way I can describe it. In that, um, you know, you've said you've no ambition, right? Uh, it's not a business. However, however, come eleven o'clock at night, the disciplinarian perhaps comes from your dad. Says, yeah. right, like, that's it. You've had enough punching out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's the strangest combination, loveliest combination of of uh, you know laissez-faire, laid back, 
and yet they're, it's, it's, it's boxed as well in a way that suits, there's nobody, there's nobody striding over your life is the way I'm sensing it. Is that fair to no. say? Yeah, no, but also um, Siobhan was like that. Siobhan was a professional. I'm a professional. We're both perfectionists in what we do. I mean, I, I, you know the way I, you know, I photograph my food and everything else. I like visual beauty. I just love it. And I really want people to experience it. So I am a perfectionist and she was. And, you know, like she had a huge uh, influence on me. Massive massive interest influence on me because she was just incredible and we she would you know we would just she just you know run the eye over something as we'd always say and she'd say biddy girl what do you think of that and i'd say that doesn't look great johnny you know like that should be in something else and she'd say the same to me so we were constantly you know reenacting those things and making them better always making things better for people and more, very important thing i was missed out in here completely is the crack and the humour. We have great crack in Biddy's Cottage. I mean, that's a very, um, stories are really important, but funny stories, it's not all educational. It's, um, you know, you have to have the humour. Yeah. And that's one of the people, things people love. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's Buddha bus going on all over the cafe here. I don't think you missed out on it at all, by the way, uh, Bridget. It came through the whole yeah. conversation here. Uh, the crack is there. Uh, it's just bubbling under the surface the whole time. Love the fact that Biddy Girl asks uh, Shawnee, uh, you know, how's this looking when you're taking the apple tart out, etc. to this day. Long may that continue, Bridget. We had an absolute pleasure having you uh, here in the cafe as my special guest this morning, so thank you for taking the time out. With a blessing. Yeah. We're going to go to Q&A from the floor, as we always do. You're well familiar with the, uh, the format at this stage, Bridget. So before we do, have you one tip that you could offer your nearest and dearest? You get through covid come out the far side in great shape by doing blah. What's that one blah for Bridget McLaughlin, please? Well, it's very simple. I was thinking about this. I didn't have to think hard. My advice would be hunker down like a hedgehog and dip into the sea and merge yourself in nature because every business person I ever met, and I met quite a few of them, they're all in a horrendous mindset of business and, and work. So that is simply it. Before, after COVID, it's exactly, I just believe that always. And that's just beautiful. Thank you for that. Hunker down like a hedgehog. First, first time I've heard that one, but I'll, I'll never forget it. Bridget, a little pleasure. Absolute pleasure having you in the cafe. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, questions and answers from the floor. Who'd like to ask Bridget a question before we go to Shelley to hear what's been going on in the cafe? Uh, Eamon Smith, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, I just want to say, uh, Bridget, thank you so, so much for, for sharing. I'm catching my breath here. Um, and I know my question is, I just need a second to kind of uh, get the words to come to the surface because I'm just enthralled and just, do you know what? I said it in the comments as well, but I'll say it about you. You are an absolute warrior walking your talk and um, you, you just, you're painting a picture with your words. You have an innate gift for not even storytelling. It just kind of flows through you, as Party Better said. My question would be in terms of with all that kind of goes on and how well you kind of hold yourself and take it through it, and I love that, hunker down like a hedgehog, that's the quote of the year for me. Um, what's your go-to thing, let's say, for you to kind of be grounded, be here, be now, you know, that kind of all is well in this moment, what would be your favourite go-to thing, let's say? That's very simple. Thanks for, your, thanks for all that, Eamon. That's very simple. I go, I'm very lucky to live by the sea. The sea is my salvation. I go in like a briar and come out like a lamb. It's just like, it's heaven, it's heaven. When I'm in the sea floating, that's it. It doesn't get better than that. And the other one would be baking with a podcast on. Um, I love peace. I love my own company, by the way. I really love my own company. That sounds terrible, but I do. And I love baking, rolling pastry, listen to a podcast, love it, and a glass of wine now and again. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon, for that. And Bridget, fabulous answer. Fabulous answer. And by the way, my own company too. I think that's a, I think that's a sign of a very, you know, good person. <laughs> to be honest, right? <laughs> life is full on. My, my life is full on. No more than yours is full on with people. Uh, but what I love is stepping back into my own company. So happy days. Bridget, pleasure having you on. Shelley, tell us what's been going on in the cafe, please. Um, no surprises there anyway that we've got some lovely, lovely comments from coming in for... Bridget and her amazing story. Um, and Kristen is joining us from Sweden as she does most of it and says hello everybody. And Brendan Kerrigan then, who's also joining us in the cafe, says great to see you, Bridget. Um, so you know Brendan, I think, don't you, Bridget? He's a fantastic man, yes, yeah. And he also said, um, hi Colin, nice to see you use a fountain pen. So um, he's noticing your, your, your pen there. Um, 
the pen, the pen shop in Dunleary, and he's had all the fantastic pens and pens in it, yeah. It's a wonderful shop. Oh, very good, very good. And then you spoke to Eamon directly there as well. And then Anne Kristen popped in and said, thank you for sharing your story. I agree with the, the other comments that are here when Eamon was saying, and what a, a forceful, amazing, walk in the talk warrior woman that you are. And um, Anne is saying that she agrees with the other comments and feels you are mastering that when life gives you lemons gracefully. Um, so yes, I think that was very, very nice there. And then Lisa, who is a regular in the cafe again there, Bridget, she says, thanks for sharing your story, Bridget. You are a breath of fresh air and such a talented, kind and caring person. Thank you for visiting my mother immediately after I shared how I've not been able to see her since Christmas. Yeah, I agree there, Colin, a nice uh, round of applause there. Um, that kindness had such a positive impact. Um, she can't thank you enough. You are more than welcome to visit me in my fast cottage when you're in Galway next. Love your attitude towards work and your passion for life. You're an inspiration and refreshing to listen to. A master storyteller with such zest for life and a pleasure to listen to your stories. Isn't that lovely? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so yeah, so I think that was very, very nice. Then I think Christina had a very quick question for, I think it's something in relation to what she sees in your background there, actually, Bridget. I'll unmute you there, Christina. You can ask Bridget direct your life. Uh, Bridget, I wanted to ask you a question, but before I get to the question, I want to thank you for using the word vernacular. I'm an editor, that's what I yes. do, that's what I'm good at, I think I'm wonderful at it, but <laughs> thank you. But I didn't know that particular meaning. I had to look it up in my dictionary to check it. I didn't realise it could be used in different ways, normally in association with language, but also in association with domestic architecture, that so it's great to, to learn a new word every day, at least one new word every day. Thanks for that. My question, uh, Bridget, my question was, in the background you have um, a picture of the Sacred Heart, and I was wondering if that's, I doubt if it is, in fact I wasn't wondering if it is, but I think it probably is significant for you. Yes, the Sacred Heart is very significant for me. Um, um, it's not there for ornamentation. I have yeah. great faith, and um, and I I love my prayers. Um, I'm not an um, I, I don't and I love Pope Francis. <laughs> Very unpopular thing to say, but I do. I don't agree with everything he says, by the way, and I don't agree with everything that the Catholic Church says. But definitely, my faith has kept me grounded. Absolutely, I definitely could not imagine. I mean, mindfulness is the same thing. I mean, it's all really no matter whether you're you know reading the Quran, it makes no difference. Um, it's I find that prayer is just. Uh, very self uh, grounding and you have meaning in your life and yes yeah, so I, I have faith yes and I, the sacred heart I pray to the sacred heart at least once every day I always pass it by and say come on now keep your keep an eye out on me for me <laughs> do your work you know get the finger out look after pity today <laughs> thank you thank you Christina for such a great question thank you very much thank you so just before I hand back um, to Colin Bridget, Col um, Eamon has popped in the links there where people can access your social media platforms. And Denise Dunn is in the cafe and she says she really enjoys your interview and you can see your painting on the wall behind me. So I think Denise has, um, she's pointing to it there that she has a painting on the, uh, one of your beautiful pieces of art behind her, which is perfect then for me to bring you back over to your host. Thank you so much, Bridget. You've certainly inspired me today. And it's back over to you, Colin. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Princess Shelley and everybody for that lovely segment. That's, that's one of my favourite parts of the show uh, every day. I get to sit back and watch and see who's come into the cafe. And you're all very welcome. Christina has zoomed in from Geneva. You're very welcome, Christina. Lovely to have you in the cafe. And that was a lovely perceptive question and a very honest answer. By the way, um, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I was born Catholic. Uh, truthfully, I'm a Catholic because I was born to married parents in Dublin in 1963. Let's be honest, right? Uh, uh, but I've, I've chosen to remain Christian. That's, that's, my, that's my default faith. Challenged, of course, with the Catholic Church, etc. However, I watched a movie recently, The Two Popes. We get a chance to watch the movie, The Two Popes. He goes, I didn't know Catholics, we have two popes. We've actually got two popes at the moment, right? Fascinating story. And truthfully, I bawled all through the movie because I sort of mourned my loss of faith in the church. I haven't lost faith, but I've lost I, some faith in the church. Anyway, just putting that out there because we're all friends here. Listen, uh, Denise, would you mind if I just bring you in and say a quick hello because that way we get to capture your the picture, Bridget's picture on the wall. Is that okay with you? Hello. Hi, Biddy. How are you? I'm delighted. Hi. 
Kieran just told me about this last night, so I was delighted to, um, yeah, be able to um, zoom in. <laughs> so yeah, I'm here in my little cottage in Knoll in North Dublin, and there's one of Biddy's paintings on the wall behind me. And actually, it's interesting as well, because um, Christina, because my cottage is a vernacular cottage as well. Um, it dates back to, oh, you know, the land was donated to the council back in, I don't know, the 1800s or something. And there are only three cottages in the area that are of similar architecture and they would have been for some of the, you know, the workers who worked in the local big estate. So um, I actually, it was, it had been modernized and plastered and all the rest and I kind of restored it back down to all the original and um, the original brickwork and stonework and that that you can see there. So yeah, so I'm really interested in all of that as well. So Biddy, I, I'm going to call you soon. I've been meaning to call you. I'll call you for a chat. It's something I wanted to talk to you about. And um, take care, everybody. It's really enjoyable. <laughs> thank you for that. Forgive me for putting you on the spot, but uh, I just thought it was an important moment. So thank you for that. I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to invite Dorothy in to say a quick hello. Dorothy. That was very enjoyable. It was lovely to hear Bridget and the lovely things she had to say about how she handles her life. And of course, she's a neighbour of mine up the road now, so I'm delighted to have met her. And thanks, Lisa, for sending her down. And um, yeah, it was very interesting indeed. And I'm a little bit sort of um, nervous on this because I haven't done much Zooming. <laughs> I've done lots of everything else coming to this stage of my life, but uh, Zooming, no. <laughs> so please forgive me if I'm a little bit reticent. You zoom beautifully, by the way. You zoom beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa. Thank you. Lisa, pop in there. I'm delighted you could join, Mom and um, Bridget. I, again, I can't thank you so much for visiting my mother. It really, it, it means so much. I haven't seen oh, it's you. gorgeous. Several yeah, thanks. Months. Yeah. So yeah, it was lovely. You're very kind. And, um, yeah, you know, if you two get to chat, Mom's an actress and has a has been a businesswoman well before, you know, ahead of her generation and has a lot of interesting stories. So she's been threatening to write a book for a long time. Maybe you could give her a push. <laughs> oh, thanks a bunch. <laughs> thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Uh, so the, story, the, the back story there, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, Lisa and Bridget have been uh, regulars in the cafe and they connected uh, when Lisa realised Bridget was up the road from her mom and reached out. We didn't know that this had happened until Lisa zoomed in the other day. She couldn't stay for the show, but she zoomed in the other day to offer a virtual bunch, bunch of flowers to uh, Bridget for popping down to see her mom. Do you want to show us the flowers again there, Lisa, and say hi with the flowers? Unmute. Unmute yourself. I'll deliver them in person one of these days, Bridget, when I when I break the curfew and, and get up to, to Dublin. <laughs> thank you. Lisa. Yeah, listen, Lisa, thank you for that. That's, that was lovely. Folks, that's the special element of this, uh, this quite amazing thing that's evolved through COVID. COVID born, little idea. Let's have a cup of coffee and a chat with somebody and it's turned into the Coffee at 11 show. And it's my absolute privilege to sit here and witness this type of stuff going on. So uh, well done, bull of bus to one and all. Okay, that's, as they say, that's a wrap. Um, let me just tell you what's going to happen on Monday. We're at the weekend. The only reason I know that it's the weekend, by the way, is uh, there's no show <laughs> Saturday and Sunday. Um, but we're, we're Monday, we've got uh, a, a lady coming in. Her name is Jennifer Haskins, and she's coming to the cafe. And Jennifer's a really interesting lady with a fascinating backstory, which led to her setting up a dating agency, an online dating agency. It's not, it's not Tinder, right? It's uh, Two's Company. And uh, Jennifer's coming in on Monday to explain all about that. So I'd be, cu be curious to see who pops in to have a listen. <laughs> Sarah, was that you wiping sweat off your brow there? <laughs> all right. Listen, uh, an absolute pleasure uh, hosting today's Coffee at 11 show. Uh, thank you, Princess Shelley, for producing today's show. Thank you, Eamon Smith, for keeping us all safe and secure. Thank you in advance, Katrina O'Brien, for taking this and making it all beautiful by close of business tonight. Uh, I want to thank wigworm.ie, SME Peer Support for their ongoing support. And uh, finally, thank you, Bridget McLaughlin, for being here. Bridget McLaughlin, namaste. It's just wonderful to be part of Coffee at 11, and um, I've been on, it's an honour and a great privilege. Thank you.